It's legal to videotape, correct? I know it is. Well, okay. But I don't want you to... Here it's only a problem if they won't have a problem with you. I, I've seen many security people wearing badges that say security on them. We just don't as a practice as an organization just to make sure that that button cannot be pushed mm -hmm. yeah. for obvious reasons yeah, because they will push that button. Yeah. <laughs> so with us, we're very, very, uh, very it's, careful. It's good to be proactive. Yeah, even the weapons are carried on the inside for that reason to make sure that there can't be anyone saying, oh, uh, you grabbed your weapon and therefore when you grabbed your weapon and you told someone a directive you are now threatening yeah one thing I heard in the Michigan is the uh, issue like so you can open if I was out on the street open carrying not an issue but like in a vehicle it might yep. be an issue so it's like, no yeah, longer do you know of people oh it's no longer I was going to say no 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 yeah once you get in the car it's no longer oh. open carry it's now concealed but do you know of people yeah, that are sure harassed for that well, that make it like no, no one, no one really does that because they know what's going to happen. Well, it seems to create an unsafe scenario because I know in New Hampshire some people will load their weapon as they get out of their car and then unload it before they get in. And uh, you know the need to be unloading and loading a weapon in public just seems unnecessary rather than just letting people sure. wear their weapon safely. Yeah, well, it's uh, almost forcing true. you to brandish. Well, it's a way. It's a it way. is. It is forcing you to brandish because at some point you got to pull your gun out, unload it, unload it, put it in the case, put it in the trunk, or whatever. And, and some people think that it, maybe it's a, uh, it was done to then deter people from open carrying, or, you know, because they could get them under these. these oh, quite I'm sure. Sure. Yeah. Sure. I mean, they, they were. There was a, a big uh, movement here to harass people that are open carrying, mm -hmm. and then um, there was a big open carry festival, or two or three, yeah, <laughs> and they stopped yeah. once the lawsuits started rolling in. Uh, I saw a guy driving a bicycle by with two blocks on his side, and uh, I know he's riding on a police station on purpose. And uh, he has the glowing vest on, two blocks, riding a bike, he always looks for police officers, goes near them. And uh, I was looking at these two officers I was talking to one day, and he, he just kind of walked, he was just gently riding by. And I looked at the two officers, they looked at him, and they looked back, and I was like, wow, you guys have been retrained, because normally, this is when the officer would say, hey, come back here, or jump in the car, go chase him down. Why do you have two blocks on? And the guy, I, he wasn't doing anything. He was just driving around. And I swear he just did it for that summer, and then that's it. He hasn't been around since. Hmm. And it was just, that was around the same time that the, uh, there, were, there was a big movement downtown here with um, NRA-related um, uh, people that were just open carrying, walking around downtown. They just converged. and. They were being arrested, and then I think the lawsuits came out, and then they stopped. One guy from Ohio, this is one of the lawsuits. With Northeast Ohio carry, they do open carry walks every every city around Cleveland, mm -hmm. as they've been as strong as they'll can. I mean, just everywhere. Yeah, this just, this uh, this guy from Kent from Ohio uh, was with his family. I think it was last summer, the summer before. Um, Detroit police pulled him over. Uh, at a gas, I think he was at a gas station or something. Arrested him, right in front of his family. They're crying. They were here on vacation. They were vacationing here in Detroit, doing something in like Canada or something. And uh, they uh, arrested him and um, took him to jail. And of course, you know, then found out that what reciprocity means. They found out at jail at the police station when the sergeant said he has a permit from Ohio. And the officer was like, well, this is in Ohio. And he said, do you know what reciprocity is? And the sergeant was, you know, so we have to let him go now. But it's already a false arrest and false imprisonment. And so that's just one of the lawsuits that leads to the $50 million in lawsuits here a year over nothing. Yeah, but it's, don't you think, I, I think it's a bit ridiculous that these guys can't get it straight. I mean, 
you, you, you're supposed to be trained. You're supposed to be a professional. That's you know? the problem. You're supposed to know there's the no goddamn incentive. law. There's no incentive well, for them to know because they're yeah. the person responsible. That's right. That's right. I mean, that's if you're going right. to arrest somebody on something, you better know goddamn well, law that you're going to be arrested. No, no, absolutely not. Yeah, they don't. It's not him paying the bill. It'll be the city. Right. There's no accountability. Well, that's how it should be, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, that's right. That's, why would be surprised about it? Right. Well, the reason why we take uh, the only reason we ever uh, use force on a person is if we have to. And have to is defined as a situation of exigency, exigent circumstances. That is the word that means we have to take action. In other words, if we don't do something, a negative thing is going to happen to someone. So if it's not exigent, there's no reason to touch someone. There's no reason to create a, 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 a violent altercation. And so if you use exigency as your rule, then you're gonna have a much better outcome. You should not be physically creating conditions for violence to occur. Uh, you should be looking at different ways of modifying the interaction in such a way that it can't lead to violence. So, you know, there's two, just two frames of thought. I will engage with the idea that I will be uh, dominant in violence, or you can say, I will go forward with the idea that I will not let anything create violence. And they're, they're opposing ideas with the same exact circumstances. So when we come to a home and someone's breaking into the house, they're actually in the house, our job is to scare them out of the house and send them on their way, call law enforcement, video record them, their vehicles, let them know what direction they went in. We do not want to have any physical altercation with a person who broke into a house, taking them into custody, because all they're doing is damaging items. They're stealing items or broken items or broke into items. Now, if there are persons in the house, that's a situation of exigency, meaning they can harm someone. That's the only time we would actually breach and go after a criminal, is if they're in the process of hurting a person or possibly going into a home to hurt someone. Other than that, there's no reason to go in there. You know it's a vacant house. You know what the persons are not home. The alarm's going off. We're not going into a, a structure to be killed or to kill someone over toasters and TVs. It's not going to happen. And that's by design. So you're not expected to let your adrenaline flow and cause you to have that feeling that compels you to chase the human who is doing something that's inappropriate. Um, you're compelled to create peace. So figure out some way to get them away from here in a nonviolent way is really the goal. And I explained to homeowners, and they're like, well, I want you to get them. I want you to take them down. <laughs> yeah, you say that until we do that. And then once they're hurt, then you want to say, well, I didn't, I didn't say hurt them. And then I didn't say I want to pay. I didn't want to say, do you know how much it's going to cost? Do you, do you even dollarize that? How about you find out it's the neighbor's kid? How about it's the neighbor's kid? He got your gun while you're gone. And then we pulled up with a typical security or law enforcement mindset. Now we're going to shoot him because he's got a gun. And now you find out your neighbor's kid. How do you feel now? Not so good. How about he's a mental patient? Uh, he wasn't thinking well. His medication was off today. Uh, he went to the wrong house. Uh, how about they have dementia? It's someone's grandparents or uncle, someone with a mental condition, a head, a head injury. They're not thinking well. Someone's highly depressed and thought they were going to their own home. Any number of mental issues or misunderstandings could lead to, if you're using fatal force or lethal force options in a situation of non exigent circumstances, meaning someone's life's not in imminent danger right then, you run a risk of killing someone or severely injuring them over nothing. And for us, that's completely unacceptable. So the part where uh, anyone gets injured or killed in a situation where there was no exigent circumstances that could have caused harm to another person's life is completely unacceptable and unforgivable. So it's never okay to say, well, I thought something and I took uh, that furtive gesture to mean something. For example, you can't have death by viper, or excuse me, you can't have <laughs> You, like you suicide. have a suicide by cop, you can't have suicide by viper. The reason why is because we're not allowed to shoot first. Even in a situation where we are using live ammunition and a live firearm, we have to shoot second. That's not very fair in a gunfight, but we're not supposed to be in gunfights. <laughs> that, according to our philosophy, we're against gunfighting. So if you have to shoot second, there'd be no way for you to actually shoot someone with a toy gun or a fake gun. It's impossible. Or a person who has no intent. They have a real gun, but they don't really want to shoot. They just want to get shot. Not by us, it's not going to happen. Because we're going to talk to them. We're going to talk them down. We're going to disarm them. We're going to do everything other than fatally wound this person. Uh, and we teach against it in general, uh, shooting in areas which uh, cause fatality. So 
in, in, the, in the event that you are shooting a firearm, we encourage you to shoot extremities, legs, arms, something non-fatal. So we really want to encourage destabilizing the ability for that person to function in an aggressive fashion without focusing on the vital organs they need to live. Okay. Now, you had mentioned that you guys will carry tools to like detain or restrain people. What would be the circumstances in which you would use like a fence tie to restrain someone? If someone hurt someone, if they physically harmed an individual, uh, if they're pro in the process of uh, damaging something and they're physically there and we arrive on the scene and the, 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 the client uh, wants this person in custody that has damaged their property. In that case, we would take them into custody, detain them for law enforcement, and we would do that with the fence ties and then the police would have them as soon as they got there. So we, we encourage our uh, clients not to go that path though. But they're paying client and this is their property and they want that person taken into custody for trespassing or breaking the law, then that's when we do that. And that's when we use our techniques which specifically inhibit the ability for the person to get themselves injured even though they're aggressive. So the way that we move to, to uh, control people First of all, uh, in a situation where, let's say, uh, non-aggressive, non if it's not aggressive, we're going to come up and grow elbow here to the other elbow. And what we're going to do here is we're going to try to take them under control and just walk them to a position of, of safety. If they're compliant, it stops here. If they're non-compliant, then we're going to pull back on their elbows and still maintain the same direction. Their vertical plane is broken, so they have no strength. But if we're here, and they become more aggressive, then our hands go here, here, and here, and here we sit them down. And from here we're able to take them under control and secure their arms. In the event that they're more aggressive, they put their hands to fight, we're going to come here and still subdue them and take them into custody. Is there a particular martial art or self-defense uh, training like regiment that you guys employ or is it a variety of techniques? It's a system I created called the Eclecticon. It's a blended style system. The Eclecticon blends together uh, all your different martial arts, but it makes it simpler uh, to apply. So here there's only three objectives and that's to escape, control, or immobilize threat. Escape, control, or immobilize. There's no fighting. So when person puts hand to fight, there was never a choice for us to come up with different fighting options to just want to fight the person. So we're either going to escape from the person by getting away from them, or we're going to come in and take control of them. Or we come in to immobilize them and take them into custody. But standing there exchanging blows in a fighting scenario is not, is not an option for us. Uh, and so there's many different options. The person is pointing. Uh, instead of coming in and we got a way to strike the person, uh, here we come in, we're able to take control of them without any strikes. Put his hands out the block. He's blocking me. And this is what we teach police officers. Instead of the officer going like this, and the officer comes here. It says, please don't touch us when we're talking, sir. And lay the person all the way to the ground and say, sir, put your hands behind your back. This is very painful, but there's no breaking of bones, no strikes. He cannot move. He cannot move. He cannot get a weapon out. That's how much pain is exhibited here. And we're able to take him into custody from here. <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> but you never had to hit them. When he goes to block, he pushes here, instead of me going bang, bang, I'm going to come here, one, two, and take him into custody. If I want to take him differently, one, two, he points, one, we have total control of the person. So there's no need to injure people. There's no jumping around. No, no, no. You just get it done. Just move and it's over. Huh?
moves or less. Mm -hmm. Simple stuff. Um, we have to open a hand. I showed you that. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. When the person grabs the officer, like the officer's here, his objective is to punch the officer with the other hand. Uh -huh. We teach them to come here. Oh, that down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, give me. This is something that happens to police officers. Here's something that happens to police officers. They're talking to a guy here. And this friend comes up and grabs the officer. And the officer's like, <laughs> right? All we do is teach the officer to do this. One, two. See that? Yeah. Immediate. Mm -hmm. It's immediate. You have, the officer has total control. <laughs> so there's no need to hit. Right? Um, the, this guy's blocking the officer. The officer's coming to do his job. The crowd, the mob might be blocking the officer. So the officer going, get off me. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, all he does is go, sir, excuse me. Oh, uh, yeah. And move. Go right through the crowd without hitting anyone, right? Right now it's like, uh, 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 right? Then they're gonna grab this guy to take him a rest. All he was doing is blocking the officer, which still doesn't help the officer go do what his original objective was. So he wants to go, this guy wants to go where he's not supposed to go. Uh, sir, he can't go this way, he's going anyway. We go here. Oh, oh, sir, have a good day. Uh, he's going hardcore. He's going that way. Sir, excuse me. Oh, sit there. Yep. We come here. Go, 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 go. <laughs> yeah, so we're able to come in. Yep. Elbows. Same thing. Up, oh, sir. Back up. <laughs> you going right on the... Yeah. Right on the yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Same thing. We come here. Oh, oh. Still no hits. Nice. Yeah. You gotta take him down so you're going, ah! <laughs> All you do is go here, sir, sir, you <laughs> All right? Yeah. Simple techniques, man. Yeah. Same thing with the block. The yeah. block of the officer. Push him back. Officer comes here, lifts up, knee down. <laughs> sir, just relax. <laughs> um, <clears throat> same thing with the, oh, palm. Yeah, sir. So you touch me more talking. You understand, sir? <laughs> talking like this, guy grabs the wrist. Like that. This is a common thing that big guys do, though. Smaller guys. Uh -huh. When you're talking, you grab here. Then they grab the wrist uh -huh. to control you. We go one, two, sir. Home down. Nice. Wrap them up. Mm -hmm. And again, no bleeding, no broken bones, no stripes, because uh, it's just not necessary. It's not just a choice. Uh, it's just, it's, it's yeah. actually slow. What if the guy's been an abused child? What if they're on drugs? When you hit them, they don't feel anything anyway. Mm -hmm. But there's bruising, there's bleeding, mm -hmm. um, broken bones, and the person doesn't necessarily stop. Mm -hmm. With these techniques, yeah, yeah, yeah you're, you're, you're taking control of them. Yeah. So when you come here, you're like, sir. When the guy resists from here, mm -hmm. yeah, he pulls strong, your arms automatically go right here. Sir, just relax. And you see they're not actually choking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you actually just have control of the head. Yeah. Right. Still, no bleeding, no broken bones, no death. So this is the kind of stuff we teach police officers. And they come back like, wow, it worked great. <laughs> Good. That means no lawsuits. <laughs> and then what's amazing is when people are aggressive and use a technique that subdues them without injuring them, they actually need to apologize to you later. They're actually like, hey, I'm sorry, I tried to attack you. <laughs> Right? But you break the teeth out, <laughs> even though they're like, man, I shouldn't have tagged you, but you didn't knock on my teeth out because you shouldn't, because that level of aggression, that level of injury yeah, is unforgivable. More animosity. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's unforgivable. You broke their legs, you're breaking arms, right. it's, and it's totally unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right? Cool. Because, uh, you know, that's what I find inspiring is that people come back to me a lot and say, you know, I really learned a lot in this, in this uh, presentation day. We do a lot of presentations. Um, school teachers, other professionals, people that would never attend a self-defense program um, have said that, you know, they really, really enjoy our training system and our program here. And I think it, it seems to reinforce based on the philosophy of uh, this organization that when people are learning self-defense, uh, I've been to many different types of self-defense courses, it's not always the most practical knowledge. Sometimes it's just interesting techniques and skills to learn, but not necessarily like practical and useful so yes I like the idea that you know teaching self-defense from the frame of mind of you're not 
I mean, you are trying to like maintain your control of the situation, but not trying to, you know, physically overpower someone or something right. like that. Right. The fact that you have the physical skills gives you the calmness, the lack of fear in order to communicate with another person. That human predator, that other violent person, the person who wants to be violent, when they see how calm you are, it actually affects them. They need you to respond to their threat display. The fact that they're talking loud or they're taking their shirt off. And the fact that you're like, come on, sir, calm down. Just relax. It's okay. What did this guy do to you? What did he do? Are you serious? He yelled at you. Why did he disrespect you like that? <laughs> right? You join that person psychologically. But I can't walk up to a guy who's bigger than me if I think he can beat me up and kill me. I'll go over and go, sir, um, can you please calm down? He's out of my weight class. But if it doesn't matter, I can walk over, hey, what's going on here, sir? What do these people do? They said you had to leave? What's wrong with them? I guess I'm leaving. Right? And the fact that I was calm and positive and assertive, aggressive positive, it's hard for that other human to break the momentum. The positive momentum that's already taking place is hard for him, especially when he doesn't have to. There's nothing threatening them. Everything's positive, and there's a way out of violence. And every human predator wants a way out of violence. They think they want violence, but they truly don't. If they wanted violence, they go find violent people. They look for soft targets. They look for situations where they think they can win. It's your job to make sure they know absolutely they cannot win, and guess what? There's nothing to win. The enemy is violence. It's not the two people. It's the violence between the two people. And once you can label it and identify it, that it's not the person that's your enemy, it's the violence that's the enemy, then you can change the relationship between you and the other human. So I'm not mad because he's mad and going to attack his ex-wife or ex-employee or his boss. I'm not mad at him for, for I'm not mad at him. I'm, the enemy is not him. The enemy is the violence he's going to perpetrate. So once I get him to not want to do the, the, the violence, we're fine. And all I'm going to do is join him. I'm going to mirror him psychologically. So when he says, I can't believe he fired me. I can't believe that my employees pissed me off. I can't believe she did this. Whatever it is, whatever he's angry about, I'm going to come over and I'm going to be just as angry as him, if not more angry. He's going to have to try to calm me down because he and I are against whatever this is. They said he has to leave this restaurant. I'm like, I hate this restaurant anyway. I hate Italian food. I hate it. He's like, wait a minute. Your security for this restaurant and you're saying that you hate the restaurant too. Wait, you're, aren't we supposed to be enemies? <laughs> How come you're agreeing with me? This food sucks, it's terrible. By the time I'm done, he thinks I'm more mad than him about this place of throwing him out. And I'm the one throwing him out. But he believes we are psychologically, subconsciously, he, he knows I'm not his enemy also because of the way I'm grabbing him, I'm not collaring him, I'm, I'm manipulating his body against his will he wants to stay here, but the elbows give me control. Physically, I can still manipulate, no matter how we have to do this, and maintain control without making him feel that he's being humiliated, yeah. uh, aggressed upon, or injured. He is literally being biomechanically dominated in a peaceful way. So there's no actual impact, no injury. Psychologically, we're communicating in a positive way, and this creates a non-adversarial relationship. And the non-adversarial relationship means we don't have conflict. So psychology is the key to everything. So this shows he was here. See this picture? This gives the date and time he was here. This shows where he's going. This is his route. That's his name. This explains where he's going. This is F1, his trajectory is step, another facility. We know it's him because his picture. It's what time he's, he's, he's leaving. This is how many hours he worked today. This is how fast his vehicle is driving. This is the total distance he traveled today. This is max speed of his vehicle today. It's incredible, route, yeah. The route to get here and the route he took to leave here. Now, he's, that's, you said you don't patrol, so that's not like a patrol route. No, that's just a travel route. This is a location. He was going to a call. No, or he was going to work somewhere. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, we have protective details. Okay. Dale, is that a software custom or is it just like off the shelf? Or? Off the shelf. My experience as last week has been great. I feel secure. 
um, wasn't worried or anything like that. Is the victim Fantastic. impact that they can do for you in the future? Um, at this point, no. But given that Mr. Uh, the uh, assailant in this case is pretty talkative, I'm pretty sure that I'll have another court date. So at that point in time, I... These are our, our presses. They're in the back. This one's 160 pounds, uh, 150 something, and she's like 100 pounds. Uh, so he, what he's saying here is that he fed the dogs. Okay, so we know what time and what date our, our dogs were last fed. This actually goes into a file as well. But right here we can see everyone's data. This person's getting off duty, this person's coming on duty. So I imagine the software is built specifically for this company, or no, is it? This is just i. Um, this is just an i device. Oh, interesting. This is your photo stream. Everyone who has an iPhone can do this. It does this automatically? It's just how we use technology. Five point two one Cobra Online, uh, thirty first of October two thousand thirteen, approximately nine forty a.m. There's no breathalyzer in scanner two. Predict core value, always be smart of my situation. Deck core value one, always maintain professional conduct. Two, I always play safe with others for my own. Three, I'll never allow anyone to be harmed by my actions. Or in action. Four, I'll be in compliance to all laws, less prevents protection of life. Five, Viper's image protects intensity, discipline, and strength. Six, Viper's manner is a humble, respectful, and professional. Seven, if Viper lives by the models, loyalty is valor, discipline, and strength, and I protect my life. Eight, I'll quickly and correctly complete all directions that not violate my SOP. Nine, I'll not deviate from my last authorized directive issued. Ten, I'll not release any information about my training or mission without proper authorization. Today, I facilitated tri tour and step. Also, did debarks for DECA 106.6 and an embark for format 19. There was one R2 call throughout the night. Uh, it was at 19201 Joy Road. Uh, no threats detected. Uh, also did a ward off in uh, Sherwood Forest. Uh, other than that, no anomalies to report. Point one to Cobra, off This is an example of a business that I escorted in today. So this is what time I arrived there. And that's the location that shows a map a geo map of the location I was at that's a picture of the place and this is him getting gas in this vehicle how much gas and everything is documented here in timestamp so we know when you got fuel and where you got fuel this is the court escort for the victory showing where she lived and our guys went to pick her up and what time they went there Timelines are always maintained. This is the guy as he opened up his store. This is me taking a picture of him. And this is the time that he was escorted in, that I watched over him to make sure he didn't get robbed as he went into his store. This is another team member. They were making sure that this person didn't get robbed going into their eyeglass um, facility. So he sits there for 10 minutes making sure So everything we do is documented through this photo stream um, activity log, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Cameras of our different clients' facilities, 